ladies and gentlemen, blockchain enabled smart contracts, distributed ledgers, and immutable cryptographic records are poised to reduce production costs, they say, and drive greater operational efficiencies and unleash the new business opportunities for the manufacturers. And because we're going to talk about supply chain, the supply management, the supply chain management companies worldwide. But the question remains that can blockchain offer a simpler, less costly, and of course, hence a more efficient way to establish that trust in the manufacturing value chains. Uh, say maybe using a software-based distributor ledger system maintained on multiple computing nodes. Uh, well, uh, before we guess more and have more conjectures around it, let the experts on the panel do the talk because they will discuss about the gaps in the current scenario, ident identify those opportunities and advocate the possible solutions all at the same time. This is going to be power pack, like how it's said. So could we please warmly welcome on the screen and have them as well. Let's welcome Freetham Datta, the Global Director, FinTech Ventures and Innovation, AB InBev. Let's also have Pras uh, Prasad Deshpande, the Global Head of Procurement, Supply Chain, Contract, Manufacturing and Central Engineering from Biocon. We'll also be joined by Ramit Mahajan, the Head, Supply Chain, Enable Emia Henkel. We'll also be joined by Swap Malpani, the global head supply chain from CIPLA. Now, this is how the power looks like. And yes, the strings of the conversation would be closely held by our session moderator, Ajay Nair, partner and leader, supply chain transformation, PWC India. Well, Ajay, to you and to your uh, panel, a uh, very, very good afternoon. And let's get talking on that note. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pashika, and a warm good afternoon and warm welcome to my co-panelists. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion on the topic of, uh, you know, how does blockchain help create more transparency in the value chains that uh, organizations, the manufacturing value chains that organizations run. Uh, I, the reason I call this is a very interesting and uh, topic is that, you know, most of us uh, who are, you know, either supply chain practitioners or in the supply chain space, um, have heard of blockchain, have dabbled a bit, tried to understand what it means, and have tried to understand the implications from a business standpoint. And clearly, uh, you know, over the last many years, we have seen blockchains uh, being able to kind of disrupt the FS or the financial services industry, primarily cross-border payments, um, you know, insurance, some of these areas. The implications for supply chain uh, was seen across many sectors, whether it is retail, consumer, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, industrial products in pharma, a whole host of sectors have seen the implication of uh, blockchains, primarily given that blockchains drive the fundamental thing of trust, you know, and we supply chains are not just organization supply chains, it's the ecosystem supply chain. So clearly the end-to-end -end ecosystem always had this challenge of, how do you, you know, bring trust into the uh, into the end-to-end -end value chain of the ecosystem supply chain? And blockchain, to our mind, is a uh, is a good way to do that. I think the practical implications of how do you do it, what are some of the uh, use cases that we have seen, uh, would be kind of interesting to understand. You know, I, I'll just uh, from a pure India standpoint, as you look at supply chains, uh, one of the biggest areas that I feel is that you know the backbone of the indian supply chain is a uh, trucking industry a uh, highly decentralized uh, trucking industry which operates with individual truck owners across uh, the world and they often uh, you know with most uh, end customers you find the challenge that uh, you have millions of truck owner drivers versus you have uh, services to be provided to uh, organizations is there a smarter way of managing that because Clearly, the model of aggregation there is not fully there or is not worked out. So is blockchain the way to kind of look at it in a slightly more different way through personalized smart contracts is one thought on the table. But, uh, you know, I will uh, reach out to each of my co-panel members to kind of get uh, their perspectives on, on this topic. So with that, probably let me start off and maybe, you know, uh, get some views uh, from Sopan. Uh, Sopan, you know, your thoughts around... Uh, 
looking at practical use cases that you've seen or relevant use cases that you've seen uh, in this whole uh, value chain uh, across the whole supply chain, you know, whether it is distribution logistics, whether it is manufacturing, whether it is supplier. Any thoughts from your end on what's your perspective of a practical use case that you've seen? So Ajay, thanks a lot. Uh, we did evaluate uh, some cases, uh, you know, at Cipla around a year back. And we were exploring two uh, areas. Uh, we found uh, a very good use of blockchain technology in uh, contracts with uh, some of our CMOs and the vendors. Because by nature of it, you know, it creates a lot of trust and the data is completely secure. And uh, the other case which we evaluated was for our in licensed products for the entire distribution chain up to the hospitals. So a lot of these in licensed products go to the hospitals and we wanted to create a blockchain based solution where we have complete end to end visibility of the inventory. It gives the other advantages also because you can track and trace the products, uh, you know, to the large people. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, we also saw <clears throat> that some of these drugs, they require us to have much uh, better control in terms of how they are moving in the entire supply chain and whether the end usage are uh, really, uh, you know, are for the customers for which it is intended. So we eventually chose that particular pilot, which we did around a year back, uh, where for some of our licensed products, we uh, implemented a blockchain solution. And we tied up with the hospitals and, and uh, we, we implemented it. Now, some of the learnings uh, which I would like to share is the first of all, uh, I think the entire chain management. And particularly, uh, it took us you know, a lot of time to convince the hospitals in terms of what is the benefit for them. Uh, while the benefit for us were very clear that we'll be having the complete disability of the inventory, but the benefits for the end user that I would say is, is, is the first uh, uh, you know, challenge which we faced. And that is about the entire chain management because uh, many of the organizations in India, they are implementing these solutions for the first time. And it's very important to onboard your stakeholders. The, the advantages which we got was a very good control on our inventory. It also allowed us in terms of uh, you know, filling the inventory uh, based on you know, how it was being picked up from the hospitals and also created uh, a complete traceability for these products, which was also important uh, in terms of using these or making sure that they are reaching the right customer. So it was, it was very, uh, I would say, a uh, good experience for us. The other thing which we realized uh, as we were implementing that, that we also need to create in-house capability because uh, uh, you know uh, there, there has to be the capability within the organization in the longer term. While for this pilot, we went for a third party, uh, you know, help and, and, and a consulting organization. But parallelly, we said that we should create this capability in house so that over time it allows us to implement the blockchain solution for the relevant areas. So these were, I would say, a couple of learnings and the benefits from the pilot, which we did in SIPLA around the year back. Fantastic. So, but I think that, you know, the getting to live the whole. Uh, traceability, visibility, or authenticity of product in this chain, in, in this example, I think that's a great example. And I think there are, it's an important aspect of the supply chain, which for various uh, requirements have, you know, been brought to life in the pandemic. Prior to that, it was there, but not that serious, but the pandemic actually brought it out substantially. Fantastic. Maybe let me go on to Prasad and Prasad, get your thoughts on, you know, any practical use cases that you have seen in the value chain on the supplier side or on the manufacturing core production side that you've seen that you think could be relevant. So Ajay, thank you. And uh, Swapan leads, uh, I, I always call it as uh, the big uh, part of the pharma supplies, the giant and, uh, you know, the national pride. Um, we, uh, I wanted to add from a pharma perspective a little bit, Ajay, is uh, uh, there is a now uh, Drug Supply Chain Security Act, which has been enacted by US FDA, and it has to be uh, uh, compliant. All the manufacturing companies across the world has to be compliant by November 23. So part of this blockchain is addressed through that act and in fact other way around me the blockchain will address the the compliance to the act of the fda regulation is the track and traceability uh, but it goes beyond that what what fda is asking for is 
every pack of medicine, whether it is a pack of tablets or injectable or anything that uh, goes all the way from the manufacturer to the distributor to the wholesalers, all the way pharmacy has to be tracked and traced because uh, they want to make sure uh, there are no counterfeits. There. Because counterfeits in pharma industry, as you know, has reached to an unprecedented levels, so almost a billion dollars plus. As well, when there was, as uh, Swapan was talking about the COVID pandemic, the so there was, because of the supply chain disruptions, there was a huge, uh, I would say, a scarcity of certain type of medications. So while the whole humanity was uh, working towards the, um, the COVID-19, there were a lot of the silent pandemics which were happening, which were kind of completely forgotten, which is our diabetes, uh, heart, cancer, and everything. So those patients existed, it was the, but the, everything was just filled up with COVID, right? So um, for that as well, I think the blockchain would uh, be, a, I would say, a blessing. But honestly to you, Ajay, um, we are in nascent stages there, but uh, that immutability and uh, the laser um, uh, privacy, that would be very helpful. Uh, we are exploring those uh, to the track and trace. The second, I think the exploration we would have is more from the temperature control products as we are having the advances into our uh, medical sciences you would see uh, we are moving from the traditional chemically produced medicines to more biological medicines and if that happens they are all protein based so it is all the temperature control so not only the uh, the supply chain efficiency or security but also the temperature of the medication all the way to the last mile is extremely important. So that's uh, the one part of the supply chain. The other part of the supply chain is all from the vendors. The pharma industry still is heavily dependent on China. And right. that becomes a big issue for us. Uh, one is from the availability of the materials. And second is, the again, the authenticity of the materials. So I think uh, blockchain and that smart contracts would come into the play there. But... Honestly, we are still in the exploratory phase. Uh, we might have certain use cases in coming uh, months or years, but I think these are the, the value additions that blockchain would add all the way from the, the uh, sourcing side to the distribution side of the blockchains. And I think it's imperative we embrace it faster because it would have been a great advantage for the pharmaceutical side of the world from the blockchain perspective. Back to you, Ajay. Thanks. Thanks, Prasad. I think that's a very good overview of the whole value chain that you covered, Prasad, right? From the supplier side to the, uh, you know, distribution side. And uh, more importantly, the compliance-driven uh, driver for blockchain, I think, for the pharma industry is going to be a big driver. Fantastic. I'll over, uh, over to Ramit. Ramit, any, you know, use cases that you see in, in your uh, organization in your sector or, you know, which you believe is applicable across the value chain. Uh, thanks, Ajay. And uh, th thanks for having me here. Uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, both uh, Swapan as well as Prasad, they, they brought up very, ex uh, you know, some excellent points. And uh, I probably build a little more on those ones, uh, especially from the perspective of a consumer and industrial company that Henkel is. So we have, uh, adhesives and we have beauty care products and we have these uh, laundry products uh, so so we have a lot of uh, branded products in all of these uh, businesses and what you know one of the problems that we face is of counterfeiting and that's something that we are actively exploring in terms of you know whether it's the straws cough shampoo whether it's uh, you know the prit glue sticks and so on each of these uh, as we move, especially to new markets, and as we move to you know the hinterland, we see a lot of efforts in terms of counterfeiting. That's something that we are actively exploring in terms of how do we you know overcome this problem. And blockchain is something that we are, uh, I would say, discussing currently. So uh, we have we have in fact. Uh, uh, so I think Swapna spoke about uh, resources. So we've already started hiring. 
uh, people with the knowledge of blockchain within Henkel. So this is a global team that's that's working towards it. And uh, as along with this team, we are you know exploring one the uh, use cases in terms of counterfeiting. So how do we prevent the counterfeiting of our products? You know how do we make sure that the real products uh, are going and the real uh, packaging as well as products are going to the consumers. That, that's something that we are exploring. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, Prasad also spoke about was the cold value chain. So we also have a lot of uh, cold products in our value chain. Um, in fact, uh, you know, so this, I think the, the importance of this also came up during the pandemic because uh, the early vaccines that were produced, I think they needed to be moved at very cold temperatures. And for that kind of transparency in the value chain to make sure that they were always at that those temperatures, you know, I think blockchain is probably the only viable technology that is out there to make right. sure that those, you know, those vaccines actually move at those temperatures always. And they've, you know, the, the, the temperature has never really uh, gone to beyond the acceptable tolerance limits. So th those those are a few a few of the things that we are actively exploring as well. Um, just one thing that I would probably, you know, add to what I, the others have already added is that blockchain, as even though it's a new technology, you know, in the parlance of supply chain. This is not. This is competing with processes out there, not so much with systems. You know, it's. This is going to need a whole lot of change of mindset in terms of changing our processes and not just systems. I think that's that's something that's important as we move into the whole blockchain world. And, and yes, I think that's that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. Great point, Ramit. I think you know it is not just about systems. It's about changing business models itself is what I would say, because that's what's going to change. And counterfeiting is one of the most critical use cases that, uh, you know, pretty much applicable even in your sector. Uh, and clearly, uh, you know, it would drive direct to consumer or direct to patient, whichever way you want, you know, blockchain definitely helps that. Pritam, you know, uh, would very keen to hear from you from a, you know, very different sector, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, use cases and you know leveraging blockchain yeah thanks thanks for having me here ajay i think uh, prasad swapnil and uh, ramit finally captured a lot of the use cases which we are looking uh, we are also looking at our end i think traceability you know across not only our supply chain but also to our customers so for example global retail giants there is a key driver towards sustainability and sustainable sourcing and uh, for us, you know, there's use case and, and we, we also have done some quite uh, good pilots in this space where, you know, it, it helps us create a complete linkage of, for, for example, you know, we manufacture uh, beverages or beer and, you know, where the barley is sourced from, is it sustainably uh, grown? And then, you know, we're linking it back to our customers, uh, say one of the uh, large <clears throat> uh, multinational uh, multinational uh, i would say retailers because it's at the end you know that's one of our key goals that how do we kind of increase the whole supply sustainable sourcing and how do we create a proper sustainability audit to say that you know the sources that we are getting from are they sustainable so that's that's one and i think uh, traceability uh, counterfeiting is also a big challenge in our our end especially in markets like china and uh, you know that's that's something which we are very closely looking at to create a point not only at uh, the end of the retailer but also at the wholesaler but to looking at even to the customer uh, consumer point of you know uh, the products um, you know are, are they the kind of really the right product and uh, you know and, and there is counterfeiting in place I think one interesting case for us um, also that that we have uh, you know been exploring blockchain in this space is uh, supply chain hedging or you know to some extent financing because um, most of our products come from markets or countries where uh, the local currency is quite volatile and uh, one of the ways we are exploring is to look at stable uh, uh, <clears throat> currencies through which we can do future contracts and creating a, a much more, uh, I would say, risk hedging against the, the 
commodity price changes and the subsequent uh, currency changes that that have on on our supply chain so uh, i think for us um, you know blockchain is a key enabler we we have a setup at our end a team uh, in india which is specifically kind of looking at the use cases and also exploring opportunities where you know we can we can scale it up uh, but uh, we we are kind of quite positive on it and i think we we see a strong opportunity in this space uh, going forward thanks freedom i think counterfeiting sustainable sourcing traceability i think fantastic use cases i will add one more at least from an india market standpoint i know that recycling of bottles uh, is in a very very decentralized model it's one of the most uh, i would say uh, supply chain problems uh, at least from an india standpoint uh, which is an important one to crack and i know uh, your organization many other organizations I speak to trying to solve that problem in the beverage industry so clearly another opportunity and an idea to you know use case to kind of think about but fantastic set of ideas i, I you know i'll just kind of switch uh, to you know we've heard use cases from across the whole value chain i think you know what uh, you know maybe swap an over to you also to try and understand as you did a pilot and you know you went through the learnings but as you look to scale it up you know what are some of the considerations that you think are important to practically making uh, you know this technology and you know ensuring that the whole change is driven and the organization benefits what are your thoughts on the considerations for scale up right thanks thanks ajay so ajay uh, you know when i look at scaling it up i would say technology and the capability is more controllable factors right because you can invest in getting the technology you can invest in creating the capability the biggest challenge which we experienced is about uh, convincing you know all the stakeholders in the value chain and uh, that is something uh, you know i i would say is is the biggest challenge that how you really uh, convince them that there is a value and how do you find a proposition where it is uh, uh, you know while it's a win win solution but you are able to convince all the stakeholders in this case which we did the pilot you know out of maybe 10 hospitals we were able to onboard only 3 to 4 in the beginning right and there was a lot of convincing which was required by our uh, business teams to uh, to be there to to talk to them and to explain them that how this will benefit and i think that that may be the case in other areas also so we did a initial thinking on the yeah. contacting with some of our contract manufacturers also and there also this was the key point because while we say that this is a very robust solution in terms of uh, by nature of it, it 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 brings that you know entire trust in the chain so the data is very secure uh, and uh, you know nobody can change the data unless all the stakeholders are involved uh, but the understanding in some of the indian stakeholders with whom we interact uh, is not there and i would say that is that is the biggest challenge where mm-hmm. we need to continuously work and we need to make sure that uh, uh, we we are able to scale it up and we are able to take it to the various uh, areas of supply chain may well so just to add on to you know get some more understanding you mentioned about convincing the and you know the hospitals what what did it take you know what what's in it for them you know how did you all kind of if you could throw some light on that how did you all manage to share with them what's in it for them in this right right so in the solution which we implemented you know for us it was more about having the complete visibility right that what is the stock which is lying with my distributor and what is the stock which is lying with the hospital uh, and the traceability as well but the traceability is needed by the hospital laws right so that at the end of the day they are responsible for making sure that whatever medicines they are uh, uh, disbursing to customers they are you know done in a correct manner there is no uh, counterfeit product which they are getting because it is also their responsibility to make sure that their patients are being supplied by the genuine medicines right so these were i think the two critical points which were uh, benefiting them as well and then it also allowed them to manage their inventory more efficiently and the responsiveness of filling back of the inventory by uh, the suppliers so in the in the pandemic uh, as you are aware that many of the drugs 
saw big uh, shortages given by the demand surge, right? And in such cases, what happens that if you have an automated system which is allowing uh, the hospitals as well as to see the, the, the entire inventory at various stocking points and which hospital needs it when, it becomes uh, quite agile uh, from the perspective of a hospital also that they are never going to run out of stock and that allows them to take care of their patients. So these were a couple of things which, uh, which uh, I can, I can uh, remember uh, how, we, how we sort of convinced them. No, I think that's very important because eventually the stakeholders have to be convinced. Otherwise, it's very difficult to kind of look to scale this up. Prasad, your thoughts on, you know, this obviously works with the ecosystem of partners when yes. you have to do anything in this. So your thoughts on, you know, how one should go about working with an ecosystem of partners uh, because it's just not about a technology getting put in somewhere. You know, it is working with partners who are your customers, who are your suppliers. How does one go about doing that and your thoughts on that? So, Ajay, uh, from, I'll start with the customers. In fact, it is other way around. Our customers are pushing us. So, one right. thing, it is better for us. So, I'll take an example of, uh, for example, Walgreens or uh, Walmart, the biggest chains in uh, uh, the U.S., the pharmacies. Right. Um, so if you go a step back before there, the wholesalers, when they're integrating, uh, as I was mentioning, the, the compliance part of it is every pack that gets returned from the pharmacy or even going to the pharmacy, the FDA says you have to verify the authenticity of that pack uh, within 24 hours. But if you do this manually, there are millions and billions of packing flowing through the chain. Uh, not from only one pharma company. Though uh, I always joke, I think the Americans consume more tablets than the the, the food sometimes. <laughs> but uh, uh, so on the that was on the lighter vein. But uh, uh, um, so what I was mentioning about is when the millions of packs flow through, although the mandate is to verify within 24 hours, it literally has to be verified in that split second. Because if, if it doesn't get verified, it is it is technically a wrong product. Mm -hmm. And that's where this, I think the blockchain as a technology would has to come into the picture because that's where multiple stakeholders will have to come together as a process as uh, Ramit was mentioning before. It's not only the, the technology, it's also we have to change the process as well with it, the systems with it. And... Uh, so that is from the customer. So in fact, they are pushing us and all other manufacturers uh, to make it more, uh, you know, uh, um, in a collaboration with all the stakeholders. And so it's not only, as you rightly said, uh, Ajay, it's not only the technology piece of it. It is the manage. So if you can look at it, it is the end pharmacies, but before that is the wholesalers, before that is the 3PL providers, then the service providers and the manufacturers. So all has to come together uh, to all the way go from the, the product level to the pallet level to the whole uh, consignment level and again bre uh, breaking it through. So on the other side of the, which again, as I always mentioned was from the supplier perspective, where I think it is more of a challenge, what's in it for them. So if I'll take an example for API manufacturers, uh, it's almost 70% reliance is on a single country, which is China. Mm. Uh, what's in it for them? In, I personally think it's nothing is in for them. The more the transparency, later, uh, the more would be the commoditizing of the prices. So opacity works in their favor. Mm. So making uh, it is little difficult on the other side, I believe, um, to convince them to have the contract, but nevertheless, I think it will help uh, to streamline the processes. But I think from there, the, the economic model is more of a low cost production with a lot of government incentives. So having the efficient supply chains with all the digital transparency, I think it needs to be seen. I mean, in another word, if you see it, when it will explode into a critical mass, then I think the adoption will become much easier. But until then, the upstream would be a little uh, difficult from an adoption perspective. I think we are like that 98, 99, where the internet was coming into the age. 
so now everybody to me our kids think internet is like a birth right but uh, in 98 it was not there at least my age people it was not there there are a lot of young like ramit also here but uh, um, so i remember that dial up so i think we are in that stage of the blockchain right now of adoption oh, uh, the only point i'll make is uh, you're not old yet you're, you're still too still young <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, larger point on the adoption part i think um, you know uh, this is uh, clearly the point that you make about suppliers and what's in it for them to me one of the thoughts which will drive this is organizations will get driven by responsible sourcing because exactly. that for organizations from an esg consideration is going to come like a big driver in the next couple of years it's already started and it's going to push hard in the next couple of years and that will force organizations whether there is a uh, you know incentive driven approach to get suppliers onto this or whether there is a, a stick driven approach whatever that approach it will have to come to make it happen so some form or the other suppliers getting on board and cost considerations not being the only thing may be the journey of the future as long as there are some supply sources unless, absolutely right absolutely right esg will be a big impetus i think for the adoption of the blockchain from the supplier based perspective because we are seeing that as uh, again the esg also coming into the mainstream now uh, so like swapan was talking about the hospitals so we have certain business we were pitching in into france so the french hospitals first send us the questionnaires about the responsible sourcing before we could even pitch the medications uh, and so forth so it was very interesting uh, way of uh, you know presenting our proposals to them okay. ramit uh, uh, how about building capability in the organization for blockchain and, and when i mean capability it is more uh you know not just about the technology but you know the way of thinking of how that can be leveraged what are your thoughts on that you know because that's a bit of the way to look to scale this up thanks uh, thanks ajay and and first of all thanks prasad for that compliment i can assure you it's the it's this zoom that makes us look look younger than we probably <laughs> are so <laughs> but uh, but but thanks for that uh so so ajay coming back to this one i think you know the one thing i would say is you know blockchain is revolutionary not just because it's a technology blockchain is revolutionary because it changes uh, or it's you know it changes the flow of information you know it it uh, it decentralizes information by its very nature yeah so i mean before the internet information was really the king right it was really everything was centralized and even in the stock market if you had information before the others you know you could make a good buck then came the internet and you know information became so easily available and it kind of got distributed however now you know with blockchain with, with the internet still you know we have giants we have internet giants who still control a whole lot of that flow of information and everything blockchain actually uh, tries to break that hierarchy altogether right so so i think that's something to be kept in mind while scaling up even within the organization so as we try to adapt this new way of thinking in the organizations in the ecosystems i think what's very important to remember is that this is revolutionary we need to change the way we think you know unless we are doing that fundamentally we are not going to be able to adopt uh, blockchain with our existing systems are existing processes are existing you know uh, organization structures and so on so i think that that's something that you know it it's a, a starting point for our uh, entire thesis once we have that uh, pretty much uh, thought out the rest of it you, you know that i think uh, swapna also said the the technology is very easy to uh adapt right the, the technology is not the big deal you know you can hire some good technology people and, and and you're done it's it's really how you get the organization to think about it how you get the organization to actually see the benefits because any time you try to change something there is going to be a fierce resistance because you're changing the status quo you will have people who will not feel comfortable with it and there will be a resistance anything i mean this is this goes for any change right so and this is a significant change the more significant the change the more significant the resistance so th 
thinking around that resistance is going to be the key to you know adapting this within the organizations organizations have tended to be hierarchical uh, over 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 the years over the decades uh, you know so so this kind of is is in the face of that this is kind of uh, contrary to that conventional wisdom so even thinking how we can democratize this entire uh, you know the structure to bring in the blockchain that will help and then of course i think finally within the organization what matters is how is this going to impact how is this going to impact the stakeholders from an esg perspective like prasad said from a from a profitability perspective from a uh, you know from any social uh, impact that we may have so i think all of those we really need to demonstrate very well and once we've done that i think uh, you know the initial stages we'll still have some pushes but uh, once it picks up uh, i think uh, i think there's there's going to be much more tailwinds than headwinds and uh, this will this will kind of take off uh, on its own Th that's that's my thought so i think what you're uh, saying you know about uh, there are various external drivers a which is going to force the organization to drive this capability but i think the largest point you're making is a shift in mindset in the organization you know how does one uh, you know change get people ready for this change and then they will pull the capability themselves because if they if you show to them that by leveraging a technology like blockchain here are the benefits for them then the pull through of the capability becomes far more effective absolutely that's well said pritham you know when you look at thinking through uh, new use cases or new areas or you know how do you think about conceptualizing and deciding that this is a uh, potential area that we should look at you know leveraging blockchain as a technology what what's the thinking you know how should one go about doing that yeah thanks ajay so you know i think uh, at our end our the, the whole blockchain web3 or crypto journey kind of started uh, a year and a half two years ago for us so i think the first first is kind of really putting together a sense of um the importance and why this is important for us as an organization to invest on it so that's that's something the first standing point that we try to do is you know many 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 my my meetings with many of my stakeholders especially a couple of years ago was that you know is it just another fad um are you are you really going to be able to deliver kind of significant uh, business roi from it uh and you know what are the kind of possible technology adoption challenges that's there so first is kind of really creating that mindset that this is something we really want to invest in and and go big on it the second thing is um uh the way we we try to drive it we we have developed a very i would say good methodology that has worked for us which is called dvf so it's it's first about kind of any business problem or any opportunity that we see we go uh, take it through these three stages one d stands for desirability v stands for viability and f stands for feasibility and it's not just blockchain any digital uh, initiative or any new venture that we are creating that's that's our model so that the first we kind of do a deep dive of you know uh, is it something which is desirable for us as a company will it erode our or impact any of our long term short term road map that we have and you know is it desirable for our customers our uh, partners etc the second is about viability that um, you know there are a lot of proof of concept that we do one of the things which we always look at is you know if we scale up a particular proof of concept what is the total addressable market or what is the size of the pie that it's going to impact and uh, that's where we kind of do a very uh, detailed evaluation of the, the whole viability of a particular solution and finally feasibility you know both from a cost uh, both from a risk perspective the business risk and the reputational risk uh, what's involved in it and what you know can we take a sandbox approach where it can be done in a controlled environment and go from there so this this methodology has worked really for us as we pursue opportunities in the blockchain or the web i would say the web 3.0 space because you know it's very um, i would say this phase of technology for blockchain which prashad uh, gave a very good example of the dial up is is what i call the investment phase 
So every every technology when it comes goes through three phases. One is investment with, and second is uh, you know where it's more steady, which is the holding period, and then finally the growth period. For example, e-commerce currently is at a growth period. If you look at blockchain right now, we are more in an investment phase, and it's very difficult for a traditional business to invest in uh, technologies, especially in the um, uh, phase when they are in the investment uh, period. But most of the returns actually come when you have a head start with uh, uh, and do the right investments at the right time. So uh, for us, this whole DVF methodology forms the core of uh, any blockchain invest uh, platform that we are doing and since it is the whole technology the whole setup is more of an investment phase our barriers in terms of roi uh, in terms of potential value creation are very different from what it would be for a growth state technology uh, you know where the metrics and the approaches are clear so we we follow this rule of something called an 80 20 approach where 80 percent of our investment goes toward the growth and the stable kind of technology or business initiative, which you know we have higher uh, degree of success and have proven capabilities. 20% growth towards growth, where there is a significant risk of those investments or those initiatives not going to plan. But one of the things which we have realized is that if you don't do that, you know, you're missing the boat in the long run. So the I would summarize it with one kind of evaluating every opportunity with the DVF lens, desirability, viability, and feasibility, and having an 80-20 approach to any new initiative, both uh, digital initiative as well as any of our new in business initiatives that we drive, where 20% is toward growth with much higher risk and potential reward ecosystem. Fantastic, Pritam. I think that was really insightful. The DB, uh, the DBF framework, and the uh, eighty twenty principle on how do you go behind investing behind some of the emerging technologies. Uh, I think uh, panel, we've had a very good discussion, and you know, I hope uh, it was value for the broader audience. But the, I think if I were to look at uh, some of the key messages that we have looked at, we have said that. Uh, across the value chain, there are use cases that all of us have spoken about, whether it is in the distribution side, whether it is in the you know uh, sourcing side, whether it is the manufacturing side, but all of that critically and more driven by either regulation, ESG, or clear considerations which are coming from the customer. And then building out these blockchains, the learnings is being very clear about what's in it for the end users and convincing them, taking the stakeholders along, working with ecosystem of partners, uh, and more importantly, bringing to life the organization capability through ensuring that people understand and invest in this. And the DBF framework, which Preetam brought, to, brought very well to life to me, I think that's an excellent thing. So in all, I think, I hope that this has added value to everybody. Thank you so much, um, panel members, and over to you, Shikha. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Ajay, for making sure that the discussion was coherent. And you're so right, blockchain is disrupting the scenario around us with all the aspects that you mentioned. Panel, thank you very much for an involved discussion and um, using blockchain, say, to track the movement, uh, to ensuring the integrity of the products, sustainable sourcing that you also talk about, uh, that all makes sense and are good takeaways at the same time. And Ramit, to you specifically, I have to say that we are not yet convinced that is just Zoom that makes you look young. I think uh, a fair idea would be, in fact, to host all of you and see you all in person uh, talking at our future summits as well. So. Yes, keeping my fingers crossed uh, in the crazy times that we're still living in right now. Thank you again on that note. And to all our dear participants now, I have a little request which is actually in favor of you. Please make sure as we come back that you are visiting the lobby where there's an experience zone and there are two booths of ILC and Antia which you must and must visit and uh, uh, get some insights, please. So this time we are coming back with a special session uh, that will focus on the blockchain development story of Singapore. We'll be right back.